Welcome back to Christian's Colloquy. I'm Christian, and I'm so glad that you could join me again this week. As I mentioned in the previous episode here on the channel, today again I want to travel back in time and examine another woman from church history, another faithful example of Christian womanhood that we can discuss and learn from today. So, as the title suggests, I want to introduce and discuss the figure of Jane Grey. But before talking about Jane Grey, a name that some of you might be familiar with, I think I need to briefly introduce you to her context. Unlike previous episodes on this channel, for the first time we're diving into the 16th century, the 1500s, and we're going to be discussing the mid-1500s. Jane Grey lived in around the period from the 1530s to the 1550s, and that was a wild time for Europe. Let me tell you, this was a century of absolute craziness. On the one hand, you had the Reformation. You had that great event of Christian revival and renewal led by figures like Martin Luther, John Calvin, who were resisting, who were reforming the church in the context of the medieval superstition and corruption that came in the centuries before. They were trying to bring back the uh, the biblical and patristic witness of the church over and against the developments of the papacy and the Roman Catholic institution. That, of course, was a mess, as the Roman Catholic leadership, the magisterium, did not want to give up authority and did not want to change the faith that they came to new and strongly held. While, of course, the reformers, their followers, their allies were committed to bringing that reform about. So, lots of conflict throughout Europe. But, on the other hand, it wasn't just religious, there was also the political side. I would say uh, I would say that this was a unique time and that there was a lot of violence and confusion, but this was par for the course. Like other centuries in Europe, there was a lot of warfare, a lot of tension, a lot of rivalry, a lot of destruction going on as the kingdoms of Europe were all continuing to push forward their power, project their power on their neighbors. So you would have a lot of continuing conflicts between England and the Spanish and the French and of course the Holy Roman Empire that great amalgamation of many German principalities and bishoprics and uh, kingdoms that were all trying to grow and expand and hold on to what they had and that led to a lot of a lot of war a lot of death a lot of bloodshed and beyond that that European inner strife there was also the rising threat of the Ottoman Empire this Turkish Sultanate coming up from the southeast, modern-day Turkey and the Balkans, that was an Islamic force that was seeking to grow and extend its empire at the expense of European powers such as uh, Austria and Hungary and Poland and those, those powerful kingdoms. Between that religious and political change and landscape of the 16th century, there was also the social there was uh, a lot of developments during this time socially. One of those big things was the invention of the printing press, uh, a machine that allowed books and writings and pamphlets to be uh, widely disseminated, widely spread out, and read by people who would normally never be reading things like that. This led to increased interaction on uh, political thought, on social thought, and also just people becoming more self-aware about who they are intellectually and emotionally. So... 16th century, mid-16th century, big, crazy times for Europe. England was no exception to the craziness of this century. During that time, the Reformation also came to England, and it brought about a fair amount of confusion, especially in England. Why was that? Because England's monarchs, the people who held a lot of control over the religious landscape of the land, waffled back and forth, on the topic of the Reformation. To give you an idea, let me briefly sketch out the kings and queens of this period. The first king of this mid-16th century England was Henry VIII, a figure that some of you are familiar with. Henry VIII was the one who formally brought the Reformation to England. During his life and time, he sought the annulment with his current wife and wanted to get separated from her. And of course, the Pope refused. Many of you know the story. But that ended with Henry rejecting the Pope in Rome, rejecting Roman Catholicism, and formally bringing about Protestantism in England. 
This, however, was an interesting sort of case where Henry's personal theology and his understanding of Protestantism would be very Roman Catholic in flavor. He maintained a lot of Roman Catholic theology and thought, even though he formally separated from Rome. His son, however, Edward VI, who was raised in this Protestant landscape, fully embraced the Reformation. He fully embraced not only the separation from Rome, but also Protestant theology. Led and guide by, guided by figures like Thomas Cramner, he totally was on board with the principles of the Reformation. He sought to promote them in his kingdom. And for that, he was called by many King Josiah, a reference to the biblical king of Israel who sought to bring about reform in that ancient kingdom. He was followed by Mary I, his elder sister. And Mary I is someone many of you will also be familiar with. Her nickname is Bloody Mary. Unlike Edward, she was older, much older, and raised devoutly Roman Catholic, raised in a time before the Reformation really took off in England. And she sought to turn the tide. She sought to steer the course back to Rome. She tried to undo all the Protestant changes that were going on in England. And that came through violence and coercion. She earned her name Bloody Mary by exiling, driving away many people, by killing Protestant leaders she could get her hands on. And all in all, she almost undid the Reformation in England. However... The next monarch, Elizabeth, uh, another monarch many people are familiar with, I introduced her last discussion, she came to the throne and she was raised a Protestant as well. And while people were concerned about where she would line up, she was firmly placed in the Protestant side of the Reformation. But unlike Edward, she wasn't a firebrand Protestant. She wasn't trying to bring total reform about. She took a more moderate path. She was a convinced Protestant, but she also sought to bring peace, which led her to take a few steps back on a few things. And this, of course, as we discussed last time, led to the rise of the Puritan party. Those people in the Church of England who were happy with Elizabeth being a Protestant, but wanted more. And she, of course, wanted to keep things moderately Protestant, not go all the way. There's a lot more that could be said about this context of the mid-16th century, but I'm afraid I could go on for too long. So instead, I'll recommend that you check out Ryan Reeves's church history lectures on the topic. I'll leave a link in the description below, and he provides fantastic lectures on YouTube explaining the English Reformation, explaining a lot of different parts of church history. So I highly recommend if you're interested in this context that you check out that link and check out his channel. But... For now, with that context introduced of the mid-16th century, I want to focus in on Jane Grey. Who is Jane Grey? Who is this woman who lived during this time? So, by way of introduction, I have to let you know that Jane Grey was a remarkable woman. And I say this knowing that Jane Grey only lived to the age of 16. She was born in 1537, died in 1544, but I'm still confident saying she, despite only living to 16, was truly a remarkable and amazing woman. Thinking back to her life now and reading about her, she could be described as many things. First of all, we can recognize Jane Grey and remember her as a queen of England, France, and Ireland. Amazing. That's amazing in and of itself. But... In that role, she was also the supreme head of the Church of England, and that brought along with it the title of the Defender of the Faith. She was also a student of the Reformation, a, a theologian and apologist in her own right. Finally, she was also a martyr, a martyr of Christ's Church. She was one of the many English Protestants who died by orders of Bloody Mary, Mary the First. And with all that said, with that great introduction, a lot of you might be wondering, how have we never heard of her before? Queen Queen Jane? I don't I don't hear that discussed a lot. So now I'm going to give you some specific facts about her life. I said she's a re remarkable woman, but where did she come from and why how did she end up this amazing remarkable woman? Let's dive in. Jane was born, as I said, in 1537. 
and she was born to Henry and Francis Gray. Through her mother, Jane had a strong blood connection to the royal family. But Jane's parents were ambitious and cruel. Through Jane, they sought to arrange a marriage that would advance their position in England. They sought to use her to get ahead and make a, take advantage of her royal blood by marrying her off to hopefully the king, King Edward, or to some other important lord. Thankfully for Jane, as they did this, as they tried to use her to gain advantage and position, that ended with her receiving a premier education. She was educated in languages like Greek and Italian, and it also resulted with her coming under the care of Henry VIII's wife, Catherine Parr. This was a good turn of events for Jane, despite being used and put in positions just to gain her parents' position and favor. Her being placed under Parr's care was actually an amazing thing for her. As Michael Haken quotes, Catherine Parr was one of the most charming and intelligent women of the day. A woman who, moreover, was a genuine Christian. It was during her time with Parr that Jane, Jane Grey, also became, uh, became a committed and fervent Christian. It was through Jane that she truly came to understand and embrace Christianity. And Catherine, Catherine Parr, was the woman who led her into that. Amazing. After her time with Parr and during the reign of King Edward, after the death of Henry, Jane was sent back to her family's home, but she committed herself to continuing her studies. And this included for her corresponding to and learning from some of the greatest theologians of the day. She would write and receive letters from men such as Martin Bucer and Heinrich Bullinger, all of these famous reformers. And we think of those two guys, Bucer and Bullinger, and we think of that strong generation of reformers. Uh, Bucer having that strong influence on Strasbourg and Bullinger and Zurich. And we're thinking, wow, that Jane must have been engaged to hold these men in conversation to really learn from them and understand who they were. Shortly after, though, in 1553, things would dramatically change for, for Jane and, of course, her studies. He, uh, Edward VI, the Protestant king, would die at age 15. And one of his last acts as the king was to, was to declare his cousin Jane, Jane Grey, our Jane, as his heir. And we might be thinking, oh, that's random, his cousin, he has sisters we know. But this was all to avoid Mary, Queen Mary, Bloody Mary, from taking the throne. Because Edward knew that she would try to undo all of the Protestant reforms he was leading and hoping for. Jane would take the throne, but she would only take the throne for nine days, hence her nickname, the Nine Day Queen, and also a reason why many people haven't heard about Jane. She only ruled for nine days, and it was disputed. Shortly after becoming queen, Mary would raise an army, march on London, and imprison her rival Jane. Seeing her as a threat, of course, Mary would also order to have Jane executed have Jane killed so that she couldn't be a threat to Mary's reign. But Mary, Bloody Mary, still being a very pious Roman Catholic, something we can't discount or play down, she truly felt that she had a duty to attempt to save Jane, attempt to lead her out of Protestantism, to have Jane repent of her Protestantism, and return to communion with Rome. Therefore, while Jane was in prison awaiting her execution, she was forced to have a conversation with John Feckenham. And this guy, John Feckenham, was the greatest, the leading English Roman Catholic of the day. He was one of the guys who was debating the Protestant figures, who was holding the line for Roman Catholicism in the midst of the Reformation. It's now that after giving this little history, this little background, that I want to examine some of Jane's conversation with Feckenham. Let's take a look at what some of their interaction looked like and understand how Jane resisted Feckenham's attempts to quash her Protestant faith and bring her back to the Roman Catholic Church. 
So let's take a look. Uh, a look. Let's see what was said in this conversation between a 16-year-old young woman in prison about to be executed versus the greatest leading Roman Catholic theologian of the English kingdom. So to begin, let's look at how the discussion began. At first, Feckenham wanted to address Jane's understanding of the sacraments. And here's how that part of the conversation went down. Feckingham asks, how many sacraments are there? Jane replies, two. The one, sacra- uh, the, one the sacrament of baptism, and the other, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Feckingham replies, taking the Orthodox Roman Catholic stance, no, there are seven. Lady Jane asks a most profound question. By what scripture find you that? Feckenham replies, well, we will talk of, uh, talk of that hereafter, but what is signified by your two sacraments? I want to pause here and just briefly discuss that exchange. Here we see Feckenham trying to get on Jane about Protestants saying there are only two sacraments. In the previous centuries, the Roman Catholic Church had developed the understanding that there are actually seven sacraments. In addition to baptism and the Lord's Supper, they would include sacraments such as taking on holy orders or marriage or being confirmed into the church or having last rites before death. But for Jane, a Protestant, she maintained that there were only two sacraments. The only two sacraments were the ones that were only presented in Scripture the Lord's Supper, and baptism. And in order to have this conversation, to have this debate, Jane drives Feckenham to go to Scripture. Hey, she recognizes we're discussing theological religious matters. We're discussing the sacraments, or as many of my Baptist friends will discuss them, the ordinances. We're discussing these scriptural rites. Let's go to the Scripture to bring about or to understand what they actually are. Feckenham, seemingly not interested in going down that road with Jane, says, okay, we'll have to come back to that, but let's move on the conversation. While we won't get into that conversation, it's an interesting one. I encourage you to get your hands on a book or on that conversation, but Feckenham challenges her on the sacraments, and Jane immediately says, hey, if we're going to talk about this, we got to go to Scripture. We got to see what does Scripture say. And as you read that conversation, you see how Jane not only defends there being two sacraments, but defends the meaning of these sacraments over and against the medieval developments on this. So you see a discussion on the presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper, a discussion on whether the laity, the lay people, should have access to just the bread or the bread and the wine in the Lord's Supper. This is all to say it was an amazing encounter, an amazing part of the conversation. And I'd love to be a fly on that wall where you have this young lady, this 16-year-old girl, just firing back on Feckenham saying, where do you find that in scripture? Okay, let's actually look at the scripture. Amazing conversation. As you might have expected, though, once they get into the question of looking into scripture, the major issue of authority comes up. So let's look at another part of their conversation. Feckenham asks Jane, or it says to Jane, you ground your faith upon such authors as say and unsay, both with a breath, and not upon the church to whom you ought to give credit. Jane replies, no, I ground my faith upon God's word and not upon the church. For if the church be a good church, The faith of the church must be tried by God's word, and not God's word by the church. Jane here articulates the principle of sola scriptura, scripture alone. When the question of authority comes up, Jane says it's not enough, it's not good enough to simply believe what tradition tells you. That if tradition is good tradition, it should be tested against and confirmed by the word of God. The word of God being the ultimate authority for a Christian. Already in this conversation, we see how Jane knows her stuff. She's able to take on the leading Roman Catholic scholar on the question of authority. All back in the 16th century when the authority of the church was a given for so, so many. 
She instead answers the question, responds to the challenge with a boldness, with a confidence saying that she submits to God's word. And if she's going to hold to tradition, be in line with tradition, that tradition better stand up to the scrutiny of Holy Scripture. Let's move on to another part of their conversation. At the end of the conversation, at the end of the debate, Jane and uh, Feckenham are just totally at odds. While there's a mutual expect growing, I think we can see, we see that Feckenham and Jane are coming to the conclusion that they are worlds apart. And it's in that moment that Feckenham says, oh, we will not meet again. And he's talking about their eternal state, whether... I didn't quite understand from the reading whether he's saying they would meet again or wouldn't meet again, but Jane replies this way clearly. Truth it is that we shall never meet, unless God turn your heart. For I am sure that unless you repent and turn to God, you are in an evil case. And I pray God in the bowels of his mercy to send you his Holy Spirit. Here Jane is saying, that the differences between them aren't small. It's not the good faith debate and discussion between two Christians who disagree on some secondary issues. Jane understands the issues of the Reformation. She looks at this Roman Catholic leading scholar and understands that they are not merely divided on the externals, divided on minor issues. Rather, they are divided on the gospel itself. Jane understands that while she is standing on the authority of the word of God, standing on the faith that is the faith alone in Jesus Christ for her salvation, Feckenham is standing on the traditions of the church and standing upon and placing his hope in a sacramental works related system of salvation. And it's simply a chasm that cannot be bridged in good faith, that they do not have gospel unity. So at the end of their conversation, she tells Feckenham essentially, hey, the way you are now, what you're believing now, what you're promoting now, places you at war with God. It is not a Christian faith. And she prays, she hopes that God will send his spirit to Feckenham. She wants Feckenham to know the gospel of grace, to know Jesus Christ. And she recognizes that God must send his spirit to open Feckenham's eyes. And that's her prayer. I've read conflicting reports in response. I read one book where it said Feckenham was insulted by this and ran away. But I also read in another book, a book, and I find this position more trustworthy, that Feckenham was moved by this. He was moved by her faith. And I believe this position is supported by what we see on the day of execution. That at her execution, uh, as she's going up to the block to be beheaded, she recites Psalm 51. And as she recites Psalm 51, it is reported that Feckenham is moved to tears. He is moved to tears at the faith of this young 16-year-old woman. This woman who was beat and, uh, and abused in her upbringing suddenly became queen and having that all torn away from her, yet she still recites this psalm and this hardened, battle-hardened Roman Catholic debater is moved to tears amazing and at the end of it all at at her very last moment in her last words she says jane says lord into thy hands i commend my spirit what what a way to die that is the definition of dying well she defended her faith in the most brutal of circumstances and then even at the block to be beheaded she holds firm to her faith she holds firm to her salvation in Jesus Christ. And she knows that she will be received by him. Truly an amazing witness. It's now thinking about that witness, that witness of Jane, this young woman, that I think we should draw away three conclusions, that we should take away three lessons from her life that we can apply now today. The first thing I want to take away from the life and story of Jane Grey is that theology isn't just for old men. As we saw with Jane, this young woman, this girl, was deeply interested in theology. And I think that's an encouragement for us today. Children, youth, young adults, get interested in theology. 
get interested in the things of God. I hear it from a lot of youth, a lot of kids saying, and I'm, I remember vivid examples of this, where you get kids saying or young people saying, hey, I'm not worried about religion now. I'll worry when I'm older. I'm too young to worry about it. As Jane shows, that's no excuse. Being young isn't an excuse to dig into the word of God, isn't an excuse to dig into theology. Young people, young kids can and should be invested in their faith. The th uh, second thing I think we learn is that knowing the truth and being able to put it to words, as Jane did in that trial, will provide tremendous help and comfort even in times of the greatest distress. Here you have Jane in prison being questioned by the leading opposed theologian of the day, and she is able to articulate her faith with clarity. She knows the word of God, she knows sound teaching, and she's able to share that. And that knowing it and being able to share it surely was a source of comfort and confidence, even with execution looming over her head. That knowing the truth, knowing her God, and knowing what he said was a source of assurance during that terrible, brutal time. And of course, it was during that, sharing that, that she was also an example to those around her. That surely as she was being questioned by Feckenham and she was given the opportunity to present the truth, guards, servants, and all sorts of other people would witness that. They would see her faith and hopefully be challenged by that. Lord willing, be changed by that. So again, we learn from Jane that knowing the truth and being able to articulate it is an amazing thing God can use to comfort us and even work in those around us. The final thing I think we can learn from Jane's life is that even for the most faithful of Christians, life can still be full of ups and downs. As I said earlier, Jane started as this child who was being abused and used by her parents. That eventually ended with her being Queen of England, the highest point a person can be. And then she went down from there to being in prison, about to be executed. Jane's life is one big up and down. And during all that, through all that, she rested in Jesus Christ. She rested knowing through the up and down that her God was a God of truth. That her God was a God who cares for her people. And she could live and die knowing that she would receive the reward that Christ won for her. That is an amazing testimony and one that I think, especially in days like these of COVID-19, we can all take to heart. That even though life is full of ups and downs for Christians, our God is still the same and provides the same hope and assurance. We only need to look to him, to look to his blessings and receive what he promises us. He doesn't promise us a long life. Jane died at age 16, but he does promise us eternal life. And that is secure. So that's Jane Gray. That's her story. That's what we can learn from her. And I want to encourage you all to get to know more about Jane Gray. If you can, pick up a book on her. Look her up online. You can find more resources. I'll have some resources down below. But also understand that Jane Gray isn't alone. There are so many other godly and good examples from church history we can learn from. If you're particularly interested in the faithful witness of Christian women throughout history, I highly recommend that you check out, for example, Michael Haken's Eight Women of Faith. This fantastic little book, it's not so long, has eight women from church history that we could all, men and women, old and young today, can and should learn from. There is a chapter on Jane Grey. I highly recommend you check it out. That's what inspired me to do this episode. But it also features uh, chapters on other figures. The uh, One example would be Anne Dutton, the famous Baptist poet and literary uh, legend. Another one would be um, uh, Anne Steele, the great hymn writer. And we also have here Jane Austen. A lot of you will know Jane Austen as the novelist, uh, the one who wrote books like Pride and Prejudice a great Christian woman that you can learn from and learn about. So I encourage you all, that's all I have for today, but be invested in church history. As we learn from Jane Gray, church history has a lot to offer us today. So if you ever have the chance, pick up a book. Great Sunday afternoon reading, great summer reading. 
read a book, learn from it, enjoy it, and share what you learn with those around you. Share with me what you learn. Put something in the the, uh, the comments down below. Tell me what you're reading, what you're learning about. And I hope that this episode has been something that prompts you to do that. So with all of that said, I can now say thank you for watching. Thanks for sticking to the end. I hope that this has blessed you. I hope that you're encouraged by the life and trial of Jane Grey. And I hope that you will live your life in a way that recognizes Christians are a people of remembrance and reflection. We're people who are called to look back to the great works of God in the past so that we might be encouraged on our walk forward with him. With all that said, again, take care and God bless.